James Francis Burns US, May 2, 1882, to April 9, 1972, was an American judge and politician from the state of South Carolina. A member of the Democratic Party, Burns served in Congress, the executive branch, and on the United States Supreme Court. He was also the 104th Governor of South Carolina, making him one of the very few politicians to serve in all three branches of the American federal government while also being active in state government. Born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina, Burns pursued a legal career with the help of his cousin, Governor Miles Benjamin McSweeney. Burns won election to the United States House of Representatives, serving from 1911 to 1925. He became a close ally of President Woodrow Wilson and a protege of Senator Benjamin Tillman. He sought election to the United States Senate in 1924, but narrowly lost a runoff election to Coleman Livingston Blease, who had the backing of the Ku Klux Klan. After the loss, Burns moved his law practice to Spartanburg, South Carolina and prepared for a political comeback. He narrowly defeated Blease in the 1930 Democratic primary and joined the Senate in 1931. Historian George E. Mowry called Burns, "...the most influential Southern member of Congress between John Calhoun and Lyndon Johnson." In the Senate, Burns supported the policies of his longtime friend, President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Burns championed the New Deal and sought federal investment in South Carolina water projects. He also supported Roosevelt's foreign policy, calling for a hard line against Japan and Nazi Germany. On the other hand, Burns opposed anti-lynching legislation and some of the labor laws proposed by Roosevelt, such as the Fair Labor Standards Act. Roosevelt appointed Burns to the Supreme Court in 1941, but asked him to join the executive branch after the start of World War II. During the war, Burns led the Office of Economic Stabilization and the Office of War Mobilization. He was a candidate to replace Henry A. Wallace as Roosevelt's running mate in the 1944 election, but Harry S. Truman was instead nominated by the 1944 Democratic National Convention. After Roosevelt's death, Burns served as a close advisor to Truman, becoming United States Secretary of State in July 1945. In this capacity, Burns attended the Potsdam Conference and the Paris Peace Conference. However, relations between Burns and Truman soured, and Burns resigned from the cabinet in January 1947. He returned to elective politics in 1950, winning election as the governor of South Carolina. As governor, he opposed the Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education and sought to establish separate but equal as a realistic alternative to the desegregation of schools. He endorsed most Republican presidential nominees after 1948 and supported Strom Thurmond's switch to the Republican Party in 1964. <laughs> Early life and career James Francis. Jimmy. Burns was born at 538 King Street in Charleston, South Carolina and reared in that city. Burns's father, James Francis Burns, died shortly after Burns was born. His mother, Elizabeth McSweeney Burns, was an Irish-American dressmaker. In the 1880s, a widowed aunt and her three children came to live with them. One of the children was Frank J. Hogan, who went on to become president of the American Bar Association. At the age of 14, Burns left St. Patrick's Catholic School to work in a law office, and became a court stenographer. Notably, he transcribed the murder trial of then-Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina, James H. Tillman, nephew of Benjamin Tillman, for the killing of Narciso Jenner Gonzalez, the editor of the state newspaper. In 1906, he married the former Maud Perkins Bush of Aiken, South Carolina. Though they had no children, he was the godparent of James Christopher Connor. Burns then converted from the Catholic Church to Episcopalianism. In 1900, when Burns's cousin Governor Miles B. McSweeney appointed him as a clerk for Judge Robert Aldrich of Aiken, he needed to be 21. Burns, his mother, and Governor McSweeney just changed his date of birth to that of his older sister Leonora. He later apprenticed to a lawyer, a not uncommon practice then, read for the law, and was admitted to the bar in 1903. In 1908, he was appointed solicitor for the Second Circuit of South Carolina, serving until 1910. Burns was a protege of Benjamin Tillman, who was known as Pitchfork Ben, and often had a moderating influence on the fiery segregationist senator. In 1910, he narrowly won the state's second congressional district in the Democratic primary, then tantamount to election. 
Burns proved a brilliant legislator, working behind the scenes to form coalitions and avoiding the high-profile oratory that characterized much of Southern politics. He was a champion of the good roads movement that attracted motorists, and politicians, to large-scale road-building programs in the 1920s. He became a close ally of President Woodrow Wilson, and Wilson often entrusted important political tasks to the capable young representative rather than to more experienced lawmakers. <laughs> United States Senate and Supreme Court In 1924, Burns declined renomination to the House, and instead sought nomination for the Senate seat held by incumbent Nathaniel B. Dial, though both were former allies of the now deceased, Pitchfork Ben Tillman. Anti Tillmanite and extreme racist demagogue Coleman Blease, who had challenged Dial in 1918, also ran again. Blease led the primary with 42%, Burns was second with 34%. Dial finished third with 22%. Burns was opposed by the Ku Klux Klan, which preferred Blease. Burns had been raised as a Roman Catholic, and the Klan spread rumors that he was still a secret Catholic. Burns countered by citing his support by Episcopalian clergy. Then, three days before the runoff vote, 20 Catholics who said they had been altar boys with Burns published a professed endorsement of him. The leader of this group was a Blease ally, and the endorsement was circulated in anti-Catholic areas. Blease won the runoff 51% to 49%. After his House term ended in 1925, Burns was out of office. He moved his law practice to Spartanburg, in the industrializing Piedmont region. Between his law practice and investment advice from friends such as Bernard Baruch, Burns became a wealthy man, but he never excluded himself from a return to politics. He cultivated the Piedmont textile workers, who were key Blease supporters. In 1930, he challenged Blease again. Blease again led the primary, with 46% to 38% for Burns, but this time Burns won the runoff 51 to 49%. During his time in the U.S. Senate, Burns was regarded as the most influential South Carolinian since John C. Calhoun. He had long been friends with Franklin D. Roosevelt, whom he supported for the Democratic nomination in 1932, and made himself the president's spokesman on the Senate floor, where he guided much of the early New Deal legislation to passage. He won an easy re-election in 1936, promising, I admit I am a New Dealer, and if the New Deal takes money from the few who have controlled the country and gives it back to the average man, I am going to Washington to help the president work for the people of South Carolina and the country. Since the colonial era, South Carolina's politicians had dreamed of an inland waterway system that would not only aid commerce, but also control flooding. By the 1930s, Burns took up the cause for a massive dam building project, Santee Cooper, that would not only accomplish those tasks but also electrify the entire state with hydroelectric power. With South Carolina financially strapped by the Great Depression, Senator Burns managed to get the federal government to authorize a loan for the entire project, which was completed and put into operation in February 1942. The loan was later paid back to the federal government with full interest and at no cost to South Carolina taxpayers. Santee Cooper has continued to be a model for public-owned electrical utilities worldwide. In 1937, Burns supported Roosevelt on the highly controversial court packing plan, but voted against the minimum wage law of 1938 as potentially making the textile mills in his state uncompetitive. He opposed Roosevelt's efforts to purge conservative Democrats in the 1938 primary elections. On foreign policy, Burns was a champion of Roosevelt's positions of helping Great Britain and France against Nazi Germany in 1939-1941, and of maintaining a hard diplomatic line against Japan. Burns played a key role in blocking anti-lynching legislation, notably the Castigan-Wagner Bill of 1935 and the Gavigan Bill of 1937. Burns even claimed that lynching was necessary, in order to hold in check the Negro in the South, saying, Rape is responsible, directly and indirectly, for most of the lynching in America. Burns despised his fellow South Carolina Senator, Cotton Ed. Smith, who strongly opposed the New Deal. He privately sought to help his friend Bernard R. Maybank, then the mayor of Charleston, defeat Smith in the 1938 Senate primary. During the primary, however, Olin Johnston, who was limited to one term as governor, decided to run for the Senate. Because Johnston was also a pro-Roosevelt New Dealer, he would have divided the New Deal vote with Maybank and ensured a victory for Smith. 
Johnston was also supportive of the New Deal's labor legislation, while Burns' support was limited, and following a series of labor strikes in the fall of 1937, Burns withdrew consideration for potentially endorsing Johnston. Taking advice from Burns, Maybank decided to instead run for governor, and Burns made the reluctant decision to support Smith. Burns envisioned that Smith would retire in 1944 and that Maybank would successfully run for Smith's Senate seat and build a strong political machine in the state with him, in part as a reward for his crucial support on many issues. Roosevelt appointed Burns an associate justice of the Supreme Court in July 1941. He was the last justice appointed to the Supreme Court who had been admitted to practice by reading law. Burns resigned from the court after only 15 months to head the Office of Economic Stabilization. Burns' Supreme Court tenure is the second shortest of any justice. Topic: <inaudible> World War II and beginning of the Cold War. Burns left the Supreme Court to head Roosevelt's Office of Economic Stabilization, which dealt with the vitally important issues of prices and taxes. How powerful the new office would become depended entirely on Burns's political skills, and Washington insiders soon reported he was fully in charge. In May 1943, he became head of the Office of War Mobilization, a new agency that supervised the Office of Economic Stabilization. Under the leadership of Burns, the program managed newly constructed factories across the country that utilized raw materials, civilian and military production, and transportation for U.S military personnel and was credited with providing the employment needed to officially bring an end to the Great Depression. Thanks to his political experience, his probing intellect, his close friendship with Roosevelt, and in no small part to his own personal charm, Burns was soon exerting influence over many facets of the war effort which were not technically under his departmental jurisdiction. Many in Congress and the press began referring to Burns as the assistant president. Many expected that Burns would be the Democratic nominee for vice president with Roosevelt in 1944, replacing Henry A. Wallace, who party officials strongly felt was too eccentric to replace an ailing president who likely was going to die before his next term ended. Roosevelt refused to endorse anybody other than Wallace. He had a personal preference for U.S. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. Burns was on Roosevelt's list but hardly his first choice. In a July meeting at the White House, the party bosses pressed hard for Senator Harry S. Truman of Missouri, and Roosevelt issued a statement saying he would support either Truman or Douglas. Burns was regarded as too conservative for organized labor, the big city bosses opposed him as an ex-Catholic who would offend Catholics, and blacks were wary of his opposition to racial integration. In short, Burns never had a serious chance at being nominated for vice president, and the nomination went instead Truman. Roosevelt brought Burns to the Yalta Conference in early 1945, where he seemed to favor Soviet plans. Written in shorthand, his notes comprise one of the most complete records of the Big Three Yalta meetings. Upon his succession to the presidency after Roosevelt's death on April 12, 1945, Truman relied heavily on Burns' counsel, Burns having been a mentor to Truman from Truman's earliest days in the U.S. Senate. Indeed, Jimmy Burns was one of the first people whom Truman saw on the first day of his presidency. It was Burns who shared information with the new president on the atomic bomb project. Truman had known nothing about the Manhattan Project beforehand. When Truman met Roosevelt's coffin in Washington, he asked Burns and former Vice President Wallace, the two other men who might well have succeeded Roosevelt, to join him at the train station. Truman originally intended that both men would play leading roles in his administration, signaling continuity with Roosevelt's policies. While Truman quickly fell out with Wallace, he retained a good working relationship with Burns and increasingly turned to him for support. Truman appointed Burns as Secretary of State on July 3, 1945. As Secretary of State, he was first in line to the presidency as there was no vice president during Truman's first term. He played a major role at the Potsdam Conference, the Paris Peace Conference, and other major post-war conferences. According to historian Robert H. Farrell, Burns knew little more about foreign relations than Truman. He made decisions after consulting a few advisors, such as Donald S. Russell and Benjamin V. Cohen. Burns and his small group paid little attention to the State Department and similarly ignored the president. In 1945, Burns was elected an honorary member of the South Carolina Society of the Cincinnati. Because Burns had been part of the U.S. delegation at Yalta, Truman assumed that he had accurate knowledge of what had transpired. 
It would be many months before Truman discovered that this was not the case. Nevertheless, Burns advised that the Soviets were breaking the Yalta Agreement and that Truman needed to be resolute and uncompromising with them. Although Burns' hard line against the Soviets paralleled the feelings of the president, personal relations between the two men grew strained, particularly when Truman felt that Burns was attempting to set foreign policy by himself, and only informing the president afterward. An early instance of this friction was the Moscow Conference in December 1945. Truman considered the successes of the conference to be unreal and was highly critical of Burns's failure to protect Iran, which was not mentioned in the final communique. I had been left in the dark about the Moscow conference, Truman told Burns bluntly. In a subsequent letter to Burns, Truman took a harder line in reference to Iran, saying in part, Without these supplies furnished by the United States, Russia would have been ignominiously defeated. Yet now Russia stirs up rebellion and keeps troops on the soil of her friend and ally, Iran. Unless Russia is faced with an iron fist and strong language another war is in the making. Only one language do they understand. How many divisions do you have? I do not think we should play compromise any longer. I am tired of babying the Soviets. This led to the Iran crisis of 1946, and Burns took an increasingly hard-line position in opposition to Stalin, culminating in a speech in Stuttgart on September 6, 1946. The Restatement of Policy on Germany, also known as the Speech of Hope, set the tone of future U.S. policy as it repudiated the Morgenthau Plan, an economic program that would permanently deindustrialize Germany. Burns was named Time Man of the Year. Truman and others believed that Burns had grown resentful that he had not been Roosevelt's running mate and successor, and in his resentment he was disrespecting Truman. Whether this was true or not, Burns felt compelled to resign from the cabinet in 1947 with some feelings of bitterness. <inaudible> <inaudible> Governor of South Carolina At an age when most of his contemporaries retired from politics, Burns was not yet ready to give up public service. At age 68, he was elected Governor of South Carolina, serving from 1951 to 1955. Supporting segregation in education, the Democratic governor stated in his inaugural address, Whatever is necessary to continue the separation of the races in the schools of South Carolina is going to be done by the white people of the state. That is my ticket as a private citizen. It will be my ticket as governor. Ironically, Burns was initially seen as a relative moderate on race issues. Recognizing that the South could not continue with its entrenched segregationist policies much longer but fearful of Congress imposing sweeping change upon the South, he opted for a course of change from within. To that end, he sought to fulfill at last the separate but equal policy which the South had put forward in Supreme Court civil rights cases, particularly in regard to public education. Burns poured state money into improving African American schools, buying new textbooks and new buses, and hiring additional teachers. He also sought to curb the power of the Ku Klux Klan by passing a law that prohibited adults from wearing a mask in public on any day other than Halloween. He knew that many Klansmen feared exposure, and would not appear in public in their robes unless their faces were hidden as well. Burns hoped to make South Carolina an example for other southern states to follow in modifying their Jim Crow policies. Nonetheless, the NAACP sued South Carolina to force the state to desegregate its schools. Burns requested Kansas, a Midwestern state which also segregated its schools, to provide an amicus curiae brief in supporting the right of a state to segregate its schools. This gave the NAACP's lawyer, Thurgood Marshall, the idea to shift the suit from South Carolina over to Kansas, which led directly to Brown v. Board of Education, a decision that Burns vigorously criticized. At the time, the South Carolina state constitution barred governors from immediate re-election, and Burns retired from active political life following the 1954 election. Topic. Later political career In his later years, Burns foresaw that the American South could play a more important role in national politics. To hasten that development, he sought to end the region's nearly automatic support of the Democratic Party, which Burns believed had grown too liberal and took the solid South 
for granted at election time, yet otherwise ignored the region and its needs. Burns endorsed Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1952, segregationist candidate Harry Byrd in 1956, Richard M. Nixon in 1960 and 1968 and Barry Goldwater in 1964. He gave his private blessing to U.S. Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina to bolt the Democratic Party in 1964 and declare himself a Republican, but Burns himself remained a Democrat at the time. In 1965, Burns spoke out against the punishment and humiliation of South Carolina U.S. Representative Albert W. Watson, who had been stripped of his congressional seniority by the House Democratic Caucus after endorsing Goldwater for president. Burns openly endorsed Watson's retention in Congress as a Republican in a special election held in 1965 against Democrat Preston Callison. Watson secured $20,000 and the services of a GOP field representative in what he termed, quite a contrast to his treatment from Democratic House colleagues, following Burns' death on April 9, 1972, at the age of 89, he was interred in the churchyard at Trinity Episcopal Church in Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> Legacy Burns is memorialized at several South Carolina universities and schools. The James F. Burns Building housing the Burns International Center at the University of South Carolina. The James F. Burns Professorship of International Studies at USC, its first endowed professorship. Burns Auditorium at Winthrop University. Burns Hall, a dormitory at Clemson University where Burns was a life trustee. James F. Burns High School in Duncan, South Carolina. The Burns Schools formerly the James F. Burns Academy in Quinby, South Carolina, in 1948, Burns and his wife established the James F. Burns Foundation Scholarships and since then more than 1,000 young South Carolinians have been assisted in obtaining a college education. His papers are in Clemson University's Special Collections Library. Electoral <inaudible> <inaudible> history <inaudible> Topic. See also Demographics of the Supreme Court of the United States List of Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States by court composition List of Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States by education List of Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States by time in office List of Law Clerks of the Supreme Court of the United States List of United States Chief Justices by time in office United States Supreme Court cases during the Stone Court Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States, Episodes 2 and 3 Topic. Footnotes Topic. References Messer, Robert L. The End of an Alliance, James F. Burns, Roosevelt, Truman, and the Origins of the Cold War 1982. Robertson, David. Sly and Abel, A Political Biography of James F. Burns 1994. Annotated Bibliography for James Burns from the Alsos Digital Library for Nuclear Issues James Francis Burns at the Biographical Directory of Federal Judges, a public domain publication of the Federal Judicial Center. Topic. Primary sources Burns, James. Speaking Frankly 1947. Burns, James. All in One Lifetime 1958. Topic. Further reading Abraham, Henry J., Justices and Presidents, A Political History of Appointments to the Supreme Court, 3D, ed., New York, Oxford University Press, 1992. ISBN 0-19-506557-3. Cushman, Claire, The Supreme Court Justices, Illustrated Biographies, 1789-1995 Second ed., Supreme Court Historical Society, Congressional Quarterly Books, 2001. ISBN 1-56802-126-7, ISBN 978-1-56802-126-3.
Frank, John P., The Justices of the United States Supreme Court, Their Lives and Major Opinions Leon Friedman and Fred L. Israel, Editors Chelsea House Publishers, 1995. ISBN 0 7910 4 ISBN 978 0 7910 9 Martin, Fenton S. and Gohlert, Robert U., The U.S. Supreme Court, A Bibliography, Congressional Quarterly Books, 1990. ISBN 0 87187 554 3. Yurofsky, Melvin I., The Supreme Court Justices, A Biographical Dictionary, New York, Garland Publishing 1994. 590 pp. ISBN 0 8153 1176 1, ISBN 978 0 8153 1176 8. External links Excerpts from Speaking Frankly on the Subjects of, Yalta Conference, Potsdam Conference, Flash Player, is required. James Francis Burns and U.S. Policy Towards Germany 1945-1947 Deutsch-Amerikanische Zentrum, James F. Burns Institute E. V. Text of the famous, Stuttgart Speech. September 6, 1946 The speech marked the change in U.S. occupation policy in Germany towards Reconstruction. Time Magazine, September 16, 1946. Journey to Stuttgart. Sideway Biography of James Francis Burns. Na Biography of James Francis Burns. James F. Burns at Find a Grave. A film clip Burns sets U.S. policy for Germany, 10 September 1946, 1946 is available at the Internet Archive. A film clip Burns wants all to share peacemaking, 17 October 1946, 1946 is available at the Internet Archive. A film clip Burns denies Adam Threat, 10 October 1946, 1946 is available at the Internet Archive. Annotated bibliography from the Alsos Digital Library for Nuclear Issues James F. Burns Papers at Clemson University Special Collections Library A collection of various works by James F. Burns Newspaper clippings about James F. Burns in the 20th Century Press Archives of the German National Library of Economics ZBW.